Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Survey Tools in Research, REDCap and Qualtrics. Uh, my name's Sean Grady. I'm the e-research analyst. I'm an e-research analyst at Intersect. And joining me today in this webinar is Aidan Wilson, who is the Internet e-research analyst at Australian Catholic University, and Weisi Chen, uh, who is the Intersect e-research analyst at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, before we get started, though, in the spirit of reconciliation, Intersect Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to the land, sea and community. Uh, we pay respect to all their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. Uh, before we get started on our topic today, a little introduction to Intersect. We are a not-for-profit, membership-based e-research organisation that operates across five different states and territories. Uh, we were formed in 2008 by a group of New South Wales universities. We're by a consortium of 12 Australian universities who make up our membership. Uh, we provide universities and their researchers advice on the use of technology research, and we provide training in research technology tools, also develop high quality software for research use cases. Uh, as you can see here, here's a list of our current members. Uh, we're predominantly New South Wales universities, but also we're in the ACT with the University of Canberra, uh, Victoria, and South Australia with the University of Adelaide. Uh, Intersex e-research support model is based around the concept of uh, an e-research analyst being the primary interface between Intersect and the member organisation. They are based on campus with, within a member university and work in conjunction with the support framework of the member organisation. <clears throat> so this slide also demonstrates the cross-institutional collaboration with the e-research analysts constantly helping each other with shared problems. Uh, the e-research analyst role combines IT needs analysis, business analysis, research engagement across a very broad range of world-class research activities. Their responsibilities include providing advice, gathering research-specific IT requirements, helping guide the development and deployment of relevant e-research services, and increasing the visibility and acceptance of good e-research practice. One of the main services we provide, however, is training on various research technologies. They're delivered both in person and online. Our interactive hands-on training is designed to improve research, research productivity and support world-class research by imparting key e-research skills and support to researchers. Since 2008, we've delivered 1,600 research technology courses and trained over 21,000 researchers across 15 member universities and research organisations. We have two key types of Intersect training, uh, open training and membership training. Uh, for those of you who are members, we have affiliate membership and full membership training where the courses are, are scheduled um, in collaboration with our membership. Uh, and they, the full membership is supported by the on-site e-research analyst um, and involves post-training support. We also have a service of open training where we have training for individuals or training for teams, whether that's a whole team of people want to organise a, a course on request or we run our training for individuals approximately 12, 15 times a year, um, and individuals can access the training um, at cost for themselves. The upcoming schedule, um, this is currently quarter three schedule. I, you can see I've bolted the two relevant, most relevant courses for today. Data capture and surveys with REDCap is coming up on the 27th of July, and longitudinal trials with REDCap, uh, 2nd of September. Um, all of these courses are currently open for registration. And there are early bird discounts of up to 50% off available. So if you want to see the full course outline, um, you can visit learn.intersect.org.au and follow the link to open training. We'll also um, share the link throughout the course today. Uh, <clears throat> today obviously forms part of our webinar series that's suitable for HCR students, researchers and professional staff and commenced last year in July. Uh, already delivered so far in 2021, uh, our Start Coding Without Hesitation, uh, Python versus R versus MATLAB versus Junior, our Introductory Thinking Like a Computer, which covers the fundamentals of programming. Uh, and coming up later this year, we already have scheduled our Research Computing, um, High Performance Computing versus Cloud Computing. You can find all the information I've mentioned already um, by visiting learn.intersect.org.au. You can find our full schedule and full course catalogue. Uh, on to today's topic. 
So we'll be, for this presentation, we're going to be referring to electronic data capture as a method to collect data from study participants. So examples of this include, but certainly aren't limited to, a simple survey, uh, data entry forms used by a research team or data collectors, a longitudinal study following participants over time, or a clinical trial in which at least one group undergoes some intervention and another group does not, and the two are then compared. So an important distinction when we're talking about electronic data capture is between forms and surveys. So forms generally consist of a researcher or an assistant filling in information provided by the participant or on behalf of the participant. So if someone stops you in the street for a brief questionnaire where they ask you questions and you respond verbally, that data is being recorded in a form. Another example might be an epidemiological study where a hospital makes available de-identified records, which include demographic details and medical observations, uh, while a participant was admitted, which the researcher then enters into a database before analysing it for any trends. A survey is essentially where the study participant enters the data themselves, such as an anonymous online questionnaire or a questionnaire as part of a broader study, the results from which can be aligned with other data collected via other forms or surveys. An important concept in data collection as well is that of anonymous data versus confidential data. So anonymous means no one knows who has participated in the study. For a study to be truly anonymous, the data collection must take place in a particular manner and appropriate tools be employed to ensure that no identifiable information, such as a participant's IP address, email, name, etc., is collected. Anonymous data collection usually takes the form of online surveys, but they still have to be set up correctly to ensure full anonymity. Confidential data collection means that personally identifiable information is collected because it needs to be. For example, in a longitudinal study, the participants need to be able to be contacted by the study team for later data collection, and the data they contribute to the project needs to be aligned to their earlier responses so that proper analysis can take place. The challenge with confidential studies is to manage the data in such a way that you can make assurances to your participants that their information will remain safe. This means that if you collect data via a telephone or face-to-face -face interview, you cannot call it anonymous. It might be a good time to mention that your ethics approval will require you to tell participants how the data is collected, stored and managed for any kind of study, and you must inform them whether it is anonymous or confidential. Uh, now, there are obviously many, uh, <clears throat> there are of course many electronic data capture tools available to researchers, and it depends a lot on your local institution. While today we're, we're focusing just on two popularly used tools in Qualtrics and Redcap, many other options do exist. Uh, most commonly tools like Question Pro, Lime Survey, SurveyMonkey, Microsoft and Google Forms. Um, while all of these platforms have their own advantages and disadvantages, when it comes to research, it just simply isn't possible to review all of them in one webinar. So I'm now gonna hand over to Aidan, who is going to uh, give us an introduction and discuss the Qualtrics platform. Uh, yep, thanks, John. So, a um, uh, brief introduction for me. I'm the e-research analyst from ACU, and uh, uh, I do many things there, but two of the, the biggest things I do is support uh, researchers to use both Qualtrics and Redcap, um, and a lot of other stuff. But for today's webinar, that's that's pretty relevant. So, I'm, I'm, I'm very much um, across uh, both of these, and I, I use them both, and I like them both. So, uh, I, I actually developed this webinar for ACU researchers a couple of years ago, and uh, we've since turned it into a, a broader webinar because these tools are both used by many um, uh, universities. Uh, so, um, Qualtrics, uh, yep, Qualtrics uh, is a tool that was originally developed for market research and business intelligence rather than, uh, rather than for, uh, for academic research, but it's also used a lot by academic researchers. Um, most notably psychology, but uh, or traditionally psychology, but really, um, really any field. It's just psychology does a lot of survey collect, uh, data collection. It features an easy to use interface uh, to designing a survey and distributing it to participants. However, Qualtrics doesn't have the same kind of uh, controls over sensitive data as REDCap and may not be the best choice if you are collecting personal information, such as medical information or sensitive, uh, sensitive data. Firstly, Qualtrics is a software as a service offering, which means that you access it using a web browser and the application and all the data uh, for it is, uh, is held on Qualtrics servers, which depending on the details of your university or faculty's license could be located in US data centers, um, which could be problematic. So 
if you want to use Qualtrics, it's best to check with your university's research office or ethics team to determine whether that's appropriate for data collection. Secondly, Qualtrics only provides limited options to anonymize data. And uh, as we shall see, it's not, not able to handle longitudinal data collection. And so it's really only suited to simple surveys, um, although there's some caveats around that, which I'll talk about. Qualtrics is a very simple program to start using um, and has an intuitive point and click uh, interface with controls that appear as you need them and where more controls, more advanced controls are available if you start looking for them. Uh, so the interface isn't cluttered by all the advanced stuff until you go digging, which is, I think, excellent user interface design. Um, they have clearly spent a lot of effort designing a user interface that works very well. It gives users control over display and skip logic uh, to control whether questions show up or not and with what's called survey flow to control how a participant proceeds through whole parts or blocks of a survey. And I'll show some screenshots around that soon. A user can pipe values from the data set into a question, email or other text area for, say, better personalization of the survey experience. Um, all survey platforms can do this and, you know, Qualtrics does this very well. Um, there's an impressive array of question types with useful defaults for lots of uh, different use cases. So lots of pre-filled Likert scale uh, questions and so forth. Users can also manage contact lists and even automate their generation from responses to surveys. So you can, you can uh, populate a contact list automatically from people who uh, fill in surveys, which is a great feature. Finally, users can intuitively and simply build reports that update with new data dynamically, and they can share them with uh, a URL and an optional password. Uh, so here's a screenshot showing a clean, the clean intuitive interface with controls that pop up only, uh, only when you need them, as you'll see there on the right. So when you click into a question, there's more advanced controls that, that pop up. There is a vast uh, array of question types with plenty of predefined defaults for Likert scales and other question types, uh, the capacity for images in questions, uh, in question choices. Um, so you can select from smiley faces and so forth for a, for a happiness scale or something. Um, co uh, complex matrix fields, side-by-side -side fields, so you can have a standard Likert scale on the left and maybe text entry on the right. Uh, very, a very good uh, wide array of question types. Um, it features a great preview system that shows both web view and mobile view for your survey. I think this is important because a lot of people uh, don't a lot of people sort of miss the fact that most people filling out surveys these days are doing them on a mobile device. And Qualtrics is probably a bit ahead of other tools, including RedCap, uh, in terms of the mobile interface. So being able to preview your survey in both the web view and the uh, mobile view is really good for that kind of accessibility. This screenshot also shows that you can pipe values from the data for personalization or for other purposes, as you can see in that uh, circled, uh, circled name there. The survey flow option um, uh, or survey flow function, and this is a screenshot of it, uh, is really great. I think it's, it's, a, it's a ahead of the curve here in, in terms of this and ahead of REDCap, which doesn't have something like this, um, which allows you to determine which blocks of questions show at what points for a given respondent, depending on the logic. So it's pretty simple to set up. Um, and a simple use case might be, say, if consent is yes, proceed on to these blocks, otherwise go straight to the end of the survey. Another example might be to channel some participants, for example, those over 18, to one pathway through the survey, and those under 18 go through a different path. Uh, you can also randomize the appearance of blocks in the survey to reduce bias in your data collection and show, you know, A, B, uh, uh, a, B questionnaires. Qualtrics also provides a very simple interface for managing contacts, uh, which is essentially a list of people who you may invite to take your survey. Contact lists contain email addresses at a bare minimum, but any other field is possible and user definable. Moreover, you can utilize the values in these fields in the survey uh, that your participants are invited to. So for example, uh, you can show them a slightly different experience if they meet certain logic in their contact details. Um, the classic example of this is language. So you can automatically start a participant off in the survey uh, of the correct language for their preferences if you contain if you have that information in the contact list. In this regard, Qualtrics has a bit of an edge over Redcap in that participant lists in Redcap can only contain email addresses, but uh, there is a slightly different design in Redcap for this, where you uh, import all those values into a into a into a form. But Redcap, uh, a way will talk 
more about this um, in a few minutes. There is also a means of automatically populating contact lists based on responses to your surveys and logic. So for example, if you wanted people to volunteer for a focus group, you can ask them in a survey that they are taking whether they would like to participate. And if they say yes, open up a form where they input their contact details. A contact list trigger can then automatically feed those details into a contact list ready for you to send out invitations to the focus group or export their details for use in another application. Surveys feature a simple distribution system that allows you to send unique links to a contact list or portion thereof, and Qualtrics will automatically track which recipients have completed the survey and which haven't, although it won't let you know that, uh, it won't let you know that for privacy reasons, i.e. who, uh, uh, which um, individual recipient has completed the survey and which response is associated with their email address. So it won't let you know that information, although Qualtrics manages that behind the scenes. Um, so knowing this, uh, Qualtrics can then automate reminders to be sent to those who have not yet completed the survey or thank you messages to those who have. Qualtrics also supports distribution via an anonymous link or by QR code, social media, and all these other options. Um, but these do not have the same options around things like reminders and thank yous because they're simply not possible with anonymous links. Another great feature of Qualtrics is the built-in reports engine. Uh, users can build reports based on responses in the data or even across multiple projects with a simple and intuitive interface that combines text elements, headers, charts, and other visualizations. And I've got a simple one there uh, from one of my demo surveys I've got. Reports contain, uh, always contain the latest version of the data when they're loaded, and so they are dynamic. And they can also be made publicly available using a URL with an optional password to protect them so that you can share your results with, for example, a supervisor or even uh, more widely and have them available on the web. So uh, some drawbacks, uh, Qualtrics falls short on some important features. For one thing, it's a software as a service offering rather than an application that would be locally installed on the university's infrastructure. Uh, this might not matter to you as individuals, but this means that the data is managed by Qualtrics, not by the university. And depending on your university's license, that data may not even be stored in Australia. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this might be bad for your, uh, for uh, depending on the level of your research and the level of sensitivity, that might be a, a big fat no from the ethics team, for example. The features for collaborating are quite limited. So depending on your university's license, you can generally share a project with anyone from within your university and possibly at other Qualtrics licensees, but you can only choose to allow or disallow edit, view reports, activate and deactivate, copy and distribute. What this means is that if someone is allowed to view any data in a Qualtrics project, then they can view all data in that project. Qualtrics has a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, a project and a survey. In other words, a, uh, a survey is a project. This means there's no concept of repeating a survey multiple times over many events and somewhat related, no way to link responses from one individual across multiple time points. This uh, ultimately makes Qualtrics unsuitable for longitudinal projects. There are workarounds, uh, but they're not great. One workaround is to ask the participant to enter their email address. Um, and then the user can either use that email address to invite the participant to subsequent surveys, thus emulating a longitud longitudinal project, um, or they could use that email as a primary key to link responses together for data analysis across many projects. Um, but this is an unsafe method and requires the project team to inspect the personal information in order to make sense of the data. Another method to solve this uh, latter problem is to ask respondents to generate their own primary key um, I've seen this used a lot, so uh, you might ask people to enter the first two letters of their surname, the first letter of their birth month, and then the last four digits of their phone number. The idea being that the user will, uh, will, will do this again every time they, they complete the survey, and if they do that correctly, then it would be, um, it would be the same across, across many times that person has filled in the survey, and you can use that to join up their responses. This is better, but it's potentially error prone with people not following the instructions properly. Uh, the most typical use case for Qualtrics is a simple survey, uh, but these and these probably account for the majority of data collection activities. 
uh, at ACU, for example, Qualtrics is used a lot for business data collection as well, um, such as course evaluation and uh, and uh, surveying uh, new students or prospective new students. So much broader than just uh, research. Qualtrics should only be used where uh, user rights don't need to be too advanced. Most simply, if a project only has a single user, like a PhD or honor student, then, uh, then Qualtrics is perfectly appropriate. Um, whereas if you have multiple people, so you've got data analysts who should be looking at some of the data, uh, then Qualtrics may not be the best option because everybody has the same, uh, effectively the same user rights in the project. Another use case which is less explored using Qualtrics um, is as sort of a smart landing page for providing information uh, that depends on logic and where no data collection is necessary. At ACU, for example, uh, 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 Qualtrics is used in this way for the undergraduate enrollment process. Applica applicants are sent a link to a survey where they enter some details, for example, which campus they'll be attending and what sort of social events they're interested in. And then they're presenting, presented with personalized information such as induction videos and hyperlinks to other resources that they can follow up on. But collecting data in that sense is, uh, is not actually important. All right, I'll now hand over to Wei Si, who will uh, talk about REDCap. Thanks, Aiden. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wei Si Chen. Um, I'm the e-research analyst at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. And now I'm going to talk about REDCap, um, which is an online application built and maintained by uh, Vanderbilt University in 2004. It was initially designed for running clinical trials. Um, but it's also now been ex extended to be uh, capable of running simple surveys or data collection forms. That is uh, where data is entered by the project personnel rather than uh, by the participant themselves. So basically you have two different ways of uh, instruments. Uh, one of them is called surveys, so participants enter their data themselves. Another way is called data collection forms, so people, uh, the personnel, you know, the project personnel uh, enter the data data instead of the uh, participants themselves. Oh, looks like we might have lost Wacy there. Uh, into a secure portal. Um, Vanderbilt University um, maintains a very tight control over uh, who can get access to the software through a license. Uh, we won't go into the details, but uh, the purpose is to ensure that REDCap maintains security compliance. So REDCap is a self-hosted as required by the license. Um, this means the application and all its data resides on premise in the institution's local data centers, which is a big positive when it comes to complying with privacy legislation and ARC funding rules. A drawback is that, uh, unfortunately, REDCap has a, uh, you know, a, a relatively steep learning curve and its interface is not as intuitive as Qualtrics. REDCap is very much a niche product for use uh, in medical, clinical and health research. And so uh, it doesn't concentrate much on looking pretty or having an intuitive in interface. Instead, um, concentrating on extending the features and maintaining strong control over data and privacy. It is a simple enough interface for building forms using an online designer and supports offline editing in Excel or any spreadsheet editor. REDCap uh, supports all the common fields, um, field types, but uh, it does not have the same attention to uh, pre-configured defaults that Qualtrics has. Like any EDC application, um, it supports branching logic and piping, but unlike most, uh, it supports calculated fields, allowing the user to uh, configure simple or even very complex con calculations within a form or survey. The classic example uh, is to calculate uh, a BMI from uh, a person's height and weight. Uh, which uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be asked of a uh, participant. So the participant enter their height and weight and the, the separate field BMI will, you know, will have the value calculated based on uh, what has been entered. Um, and this BMI field, the value in the BMI field can be then used in evaluations. For example, you can ask another question for those 
um, whose BMI is higher than a certain threshold. Um, well, this is possible in Quadrix. It is fairly complicated for a novice user to set up there. REDCap uh, fundamentally works very well with events, repetitions, and can manage uh, participants through uh, the events in a longitudinal study. Also, uh, REDCap provides users with extremely good control over user rights and access to data, reports, and exports, and is quite suited to uh, projects in, a, uh, in which a team of people might have different roles on a project, even down to clinical staff in a hospital context that need to enter data for a patient. So the, this slide, um, from this slide, we will show some exam examples of REDCap and the features around data security. Here um, on this slide, you can see that um, a user can be given specific access to different functions and can be allowed to only view certain levels of data. You might, have, you might have noticed that um, you can also limit users to only seeing data, which is de-identified. This race is another great feature of REDCap, which is uh, that when adding fields, you can indicate which fields are, are, are identifiers and marking them as such will mean that um, you can automatically prevent a user or a user role from seeing these fields in the data. This slide, this screenshot illustrates one key difference between Fortrix and uh, REDCap, which is in REDCap, you can have multiple instruments uh, in one single project. Um, and each instrument can, you know, can be made into a survey or can be left as uh, a data entry form. So this slide um, shows you uh, that you can configure events within which different instruments can be enabled or disabled, allowing the user to build complex longitudinal studies out of a small number of data collection instruments. And this example um, is uh, what we have helped uh, recently with a fairly complex REDCap project. You can see that there are so many uh, instruments here. And this, uh, this project consists of uh, um, you know, a number of standard measures each as a separate instrument and a couple of uh, demographic and uh, project related forms. And this slide um, shows you the lineup of instruments within events. Uh, it may look complicated, but the important thing uh, to note here is that um, the project differentiate important parts of the project into separate um, events like the enrollment phase, which uh, may include withdrawal, and the measures themselves, which occur at different times uh, prior to the intervention, for example, uh, immediately after the inter intervention, and then again at three, six, 12 months, for example. And you can have Looks like Wacy is on a dodgy connection. All right. Well, I might jump in for him then. So Wacy was explaining our um, <coughs> lineup of events. So in effect, by setting up our survey like this, at each of these time points, um, REDCap can automatically email our participants with an invitation with a um, unique link to commence each event's measures. and. Critically for confidentiality, the information about which email is associated with which individual in the data set is, under the con is entirely under the control of the lead investigator and the, the security they've set up. Okay. The most recent version of uh, REDCap, which is version 11, uh, released not too long ago, uh, has actually added a function called Project Dashboards. So the dashboards are similar to Qualtrics reports. Um, users can construct tables and charts uh, interspersed with text, titles, and other information to produce reports that are based on live data. And so they are updated when more records are created. The visualizations you can create are quite basic though, and dashboards might not be able to perform all the reporting you need them to do. But um, as dashboards can be made publicly available via URL and can be exported PDF, they're a great way to monitor the progress of a project. Um, as they're quite new, there are still some bugs to be ironed out and um, 
not all sites, not all institutions will already have access to um, to them if they um, don't upgrade uh, frequently. Yeah, um, as we have mentioned, um, one of the criticisms some people do have of REDCap is it can be seen as, as a bit of a steep learning curve and um, users typically won't be able to dive in head first and start using without maybe getting some training or spending some time reading their built-in help or the FAQs. Um, the interface really isn't pretty. Um, while there's options to modify colors and fonts, um, they are somewhat limited and they improve over time. Um, and there are some very basic um, features missing like uh, the ability to have a uh, configure field that has multiple subfields, like an address field with multiple parts, like street number, street name. Now there are external modules available and there is um, field embedding available. Um, it may initially be beyond the capability of a novice user, so might require some um, instruction. Um, it might be clear now where the boundaries between Qualtrics and REDCap exist, um, and that REDCap is generally more suited to more complex requirements of longitudinal studies or clinical trials. But, you know, it can also do simple surveys, um, and depending on what you need that survey, it might be a bit of overkill. So we'll give some very generic, uh, general um, recommendations about where to start and which tool may be better for a given situation. Um, and we'll provide a bit more information on where you can go for further assistance and support. Uh, generally speaking, um, and now obviously we're gonna say Qualtrics versus Redcap, but depending on your um, institution, um, you may not have a, you may not have Qualtrics and lots of tools um, Lots of institutions now have something like Question Pro, or you may have something on the lines of Lyme Survey. Um, kind of when you talk about Question Pro, somewhat interchangeable with Qualtrics in this um, recommendation. So it's often appropriate for researchers to start out using a tool like Qualtrics and then possibly graduate to REDCap when they need to. Now that could be when a project becomes longitudinal or when the, the data being collected is actually sensitive data or possibly when more fine-grained control over user rights and data access is required. Uh, if you're collecting survey data for an honours project, for example, the steeper learning curve of REDCap might make it unsuitable um, since you'll have a shorter time frame to um, complete your research. That said, you know, if your um, honours project requires longitudinal data collection, it's probably worth the effort to then learn REDCap as it's gonna handle this more simply in the long run. Uh, some Universities or institutions may require researchers to use Red Cup for projects that collect sensitive data or when the project is deemed high risk by the HREC. Um, you should always check with your own research office or the HREC when deciding what tool to use to make sure you're choosing the appropriate one and that you can access um, appropriate assistance. Um, Qualtrics can also generally be used for data collection that is not based for research. I very often use, as Aidan mentioned, for um, business data collection or operational or administrative collection. So where can you find support for these tools? Um, for Qualtrics, you know, being a paid product, the online documentation is excellent. Um, and you can generally find on their site information just about every feature. Um, but be aware that depending on the license your university or institution has, you may not be able to access every feature that they have. Um, they also have very good support site and uh, good community forums for peer support and assistance as well. Uh, another good place to find support might be your university's local brand administrator. Um, and for most of us, you will be able to, um, you know, contact your local IT, we'll be able to help you with that. Uh, as for REDCap, there's, there's very good, there's good built-in FAQs and documentation and lots of links to videos um, explaining many of the features. There are lots of online training materials as well, and your local admin um, can point you to them. Um, speaking of which, generally speaking, your local admin will be a very good source of support, and you can always find the contact details for your REDCap administrator uh, from within any, any REDCap project page. You just look for the button that says um, contact REDCap administrator, and it'll have their email um, embedded in it. Uh, further to this, um, 
when looking for a bit more bespoke support, researchers um, at our member institution can also contact um, their local e-research analyst um, at the university uh, or, or their local REDCAP administrator as well. Um, for non-members, you can obviously contact the administrators, REDCAP or Qualtrics at your institution. Um, if you need further more detailed support, these are often quite busy people um, with lots of users. Uh, we also offer Intersect offers e-research consulting across not just survey tools, but a number of technologies. Um, and we offer significant discounts as well with this to um, current students. So you can, um, if you have any questions about that, you can ask us in the chat or the Q&A or email help at intersect.org.au to find more. Um, as far as training goes, um, Qualtrics does offer their own self-paced online training uh, called XM Basecamp, which you can access from their website. Um, in addition to this, you can optionally pay for certification. So you can undertake the Basecamp training um, and they offer some a form of accreditation through the website if you've completed that and then allows you to offer professional services to others. Um, Intersect does also provide training in these tools, which is um, free for researchers from our member institutions. Um, although, as we have mentioned, there are paid options for um, researchers from non-members. Um, we currently run an introductory Qualtrics course with an advanced course currently being written, um, which we'll be launching later this year. Uh, and in REDCAP, we have an introductory and a more advanced course, um, which focuses on you know, the introductory, the really beginning steps, um, data collection and surveys with REDCAP gets you started in REDCap, introduces the key features and some branching logic and piping, the, the tools to really that most of us would need to get started. And we also run a um, longitudinal trials in REDCap course, which moves on to um, some more advanced features um, and how to set up a longitudinal study. Um, if you are a member institution, you can uh, keep an eye on the schedule for upcoming web courses on our website or however your university advertises training. Um, if you can't find the course happening at your uni, uh, you can contact your local e-research analyst um, to find out if there are any planned coming. Um, alternatively, if you are, again, from a non-member, you can also contact us at um, training at intersect.org.au. We'll also um, provide you with some information you may need. Okay, there's those two uh, websites and the uh, email that I've mentioned, if you have any questions about actual intersex services or gaining access to some training. Um, we've had lots of questions going through the Q&A. If you um, have any more questions, uh, keep typing away. We have been answering them largely through the chat as we've gone along, but we can answer them with a bit of a discussion. Um, now, uh, so this is probably a good one to bring up. Someone has asked, and um, Wacey and Aiden have both um, answered this in the text, but it's a question that a lot of people have. Um, so why, we've said several times, why can't we use Qualtrics for a longitudinal survey? Um, I suppose we, we've kind of said in, the, in our, what we said here that you can't, but, We've qualified, Adam's qualified that in his part as well about you can, but the key block here is the one to one relationship where one survey equals one project. Whereas in REDCap, we can have one project can equal many surveys and or many forms. You're not limited, you can combination of the both. And REDCap does the work for us of doing this linking. Okay, so we don't have to do um, examples of what Aiden said, you know getting people to put in their email, which doesn't work if we're trying to keep things anonymous or, you know, generating a code um, that people can put in incorrectly or, you know, people make typos as well. So that's yeah. one of the real advantages of using. Um, yeah, when, when asked this, I, I often say, I mean, you, you can, you can configure Qualtrics to do longitudinal uh, data collection. It, it just takes a lot of, um, uh, a lot of effort to get it right when REDCap does it out of the box. Um, and it's very simple and straightforward to set up because REDCap was built for clinical data collection. Uh, it was made to support clinical trials. Um, 
Uh, so that was one of its kind of user requirements right from the get-go, whereas Qualtrics is really set up for, you know, uh, uh, marketing, product testing and so forth. Um, you know, show some an image, would you, would you buy this car? That, that sort of research is where Qualtrics um, came from. Um, so, you know, there's, there's many ways we've discussed uh, a few of them. Uh, you know, you could, you could, for example, you could set up an automated uh, contact list trigger. So if somebody, um, once somebody gets to the end of your initial survey, you can automatically add them to a contact list. And then, you know, at one point you send out that, you send out invitations to the second survey or something. Um, but, uh, you know, another way would be, um, uh, actually someone had a question that I sort of um, answered in the, uh, in the Q and A. Um, is it possible to generate, uh, Sharon's question, is it possible to generate random unique identifiers in Qualtrics to de-identify sensitive data, or is this not available? Um, the answer is yes, and, and Qualtrics means a, a sort of unique uh, response ID, uh, which I've used before. So I've actually had people pipe, um, send uh, respondents from Qualtrics into REDCap, uh, and I've used the response ID to send with the, you know, they basically they, they get a, a link they click on it, it takes them to REDCap, and when they go to REDCap, it automatically inserts that response ID into, into REDCap um, so that you can track which response in Qualtrics this response in REDCap is associated with. Um, and there's no reason you couldn't do that in entirely in Qualtrics. So you can have two projects and use that response ID between them. The, you, but for you know most novice users who are not familiar with either platform, getting that set up in Qualtrics would be uh, would take a lot of effort, whereas getting that set up in REDCap is is pretty much standard out of the box, and there's good built-in help guides on 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 doing on doing that. So it's not about we're not saying don't use Qualtrics for longitudinal data collection. Um, uh, we're just we're you know, and we don't want to be seen to be dissing one over the other. They both have their strengths, and one of REDCap's strengths is longitudinal data collection. Okay, I've got another question here. Um, just on one. So, um, Ray has asked which platform is better for bipolar like at scale items? Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I think like you, I know how to think about, I can't think of an answer either way specifically. Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of one more. It probably isn't what's going to make the decision for you going the tool either way. Um, it's probably more to do with the actual, what questions you're asking will decide the tool. They can both do this kind of thing. You can um, set up both of these types of questions in either. Um, so I'm not really sure which way to strongly recommend you. Probably probably a lot of other aspects about the research itself or the questions you're asking would, would guide your decision either way there. Yeah, I don't think looking for, I don't think bipolar like at scales is going to be the deciding factor. It's likely yeah. going to be something else, like how complex is your, is your, your survey uh, otherwise. Um, the, these items are quite ugly in, in Qualtrics, Ray also says. Um, and I, I have to say, if they're ugly in Qualtrics, they're likely to be even uglier in RedCap. I mean, let's be fair. <laughs> RedCap has not spent a lot of its time on the interface. Um, uh, so Peter's also asked, do we recommend one product over the other for facilitating data collection in the field? So without internet access, um, I suppose both one, can do it. What's that? Um, both can do it. Yeah. Um, I actually think that, so both have an offline app. Um, so that is an app that you can install on an iPad, um, and download the survey to it, go out into the field without internet access, complete the survey on say a phone or an iPad. Um, and the, it uploads the data to the server when it comes to, you know, be within, in, within a internet, with, when it comes back online. Um, uh, having played with it a little bit, I've only played with a little bit in REDCap and uh, it's not oriented towards uh, survey respondents, it's oriented towards data entry personnel. So you see all the kind of, you know, the back end stuff like, you know, um, uh, I won't, Give much of examples, but it's it's not it's not a very pretty uh, end user experience. So it's more for people that are familiar with the study, familiar with the data collection, and know uh, how to work it. Um, 
whereas the Qualtrics app is much more like a kiosk app, um, uh, a kiosk mode in an app where you can lock it down, like you could have literally have an iPad at the door of somewhere and someone can go up and complete the Qualtrics survey offline, it stores it on the iPad, and then they take the iPad back, plug it in, and all those responses are sent up to the Qualtrics uh, servers. Um, so, but again, like, again, that may not be the deciding factor of which one you use. I mean, both can do it. It's probably the experience is a little bit easier in Qualtrics. And if it's oriented towards uh, a field survey collection, I'd say probably Qualtrics because it's uh, that's more, it's a better in experience for the end user, I think. Yeah, I agree. It, it's probably also worth noting that um, there is the possibility to like upload bulk lots of data as well. You know, if you have it stored somewhere else, you can format it and upload it to either product as well. So you, um, you know, if you happen to be harvesting some data from another source or you had a pre-existing database, it is possible to, you know, format um, your data and red cap and both give you quite nice templates to load this data in and tell you how to, um, uh, how to do this. And so you can bring all that data in without, you know, having to, go through and enter all of these individually um, if you, you know, are transferring between tools or have a lot of uh, offline data collection. Uh, so Alison's asking as well, about, yeah, can institution put protections in place to use Qualtrics for health data, so sensitive data that is not stored offshore and paid to do so? Um, in short, yes, you can. Um, choose part of the institution gaining their license, you can elect to have the data stored in Australian data centers. Um, and that will be part of, um, you know, the, the licensing arrangements. Um, previously, um, I don't know, institution I used to work at, they had multiple Qualtrics um, instances. The Qualtrics instance used by um, the business faculty was actually an offshore data center because they were less likely to be collecting sensitive data and definitely weren't collecting health data. Whereas the um, psychologists who were using Qualtrics were actually on a different instance, had their own license and their license, their data center was backed up in Australia. So um, it is possible for at the institution level when you know deciding on a survey tool. And I guess that's one of the things the, the, one of the advantages of REDCap is obviously you don't have to um, make this decision. The decision's made for you by REDCap. The way it's structured, it has to be hosted by your own um, institution and infrastructure. So it won't be... Um... I might point out a really important thing here is that we, we can't give you advice on which one you can use for, for what, right? Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to give you a bit of an overview about each, uh, the capabilities of each. And we're speaking from personal experience about the universities that we work with in terms of what uh, the university prefers people to use for what. But uh, questions like, can you use Qualtrics for sensitive data collection at your university have to be directed to your research office or your ethics, um, ethics committee. Um, so we, we absolutely can't give advice around that. But, you know, in, in, as Sean says, you know, there are, yeah, there are sites that have Australian data storage. So that issue may not exist, but the other issues around the lack of uh, individual controls over data access in Qualtrics may mean that your university might ask you to use REDCap instead of uh, Qualtrics for, for something that's sensitive. So I, th I think it's one of, one of the killer features of REDCap is that you can, at a really granular level, um, you can say, uh, this user has uh, the ability to uh, read the data in this form, but not in this form. So you could say, you could have your data analysts not have any access to any contact information um, and other people like your study uh, uh, coordinators have access to the contact information but none of the response data um, none of the medical information for example so you, you can effectively compartmentalize the um the the data which is which is really great you just can't do that in portraits um So there was one about um, progress bars that um, just came up. I know Aiden's just done a nice one on a survey we just distributed. Um, whether we can have progress bars on surveys, uh, in short, yes. In Qualtrics, it's a matter of ticking a box and saying, show the progress bar. Um, whereas in REDCap, 
it's almost kind of like a workaround adding in a progress bar to display um, on the pages. Um, you're kind of manually creating the progress bar and depending on the page they're on is how full the bar is. Um, that's one of, that, that's a really good example. That's a great question on um, what we were talking about. Like Qualtrics has this really nice interface, like what people might be used to from something like SurveyMonkey. It's easy to click, it knows the major features you want and most people will use. Um, whereas Redcap, they've kind of gone, we're gonna put all our effort into making this really research, like really functional for research. We're gonna make it really good at security and user rights. We're gonna make it really good at handling longitudinal studies and multiple events and surveys. So often there are ways to um, uh, achieve these things in REDCap as well. Some of the little niceties and almost like the bells and whistles. Whereas, yeah, it can be a tick box on Qualtrics is often not, not quite the same in um, uh, REDCap. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that, that's pretty. That's pretty, pretty typical. So the so I've done a lot of, uh, I've, got, I've got a lot of experience doing things like customizing CSS and uh, uh, HTML in blogs and so on from ten to fifteen years ago. So I've used a lot of that. And someone asked a question before about Shazam, which is an external module that's available for uh, Redcap that allows people to um, do lots of crazy stuff in the uh, with the formatting of a survey and make it look much much better. These things are possible, but they basically require you to be a, a programmer to, to take advantage of them. Um, and that's not um, uh, uncommon for REDCap, um, that it's, it's so extensible, you can do, you could do, you know, just about anything, uh, maybe with some limitations, but uh, you need to know how to, you need to know how to do them effectively, um, corresponding to the, you know, click a box to say, yes, show the progress bar. Um, but yeah, as Sean mentioned, if anybody has received the invitation to do our uh, training impact survey, if you've done a course with us um, over the last couple of years, then you will have received this, this email that you know, there's a progress bar on that that I did in, in HTML, but it's manually configured. So you've got to, at, yeah, at each page, you have to say, show the progress bar being 25% full at this point and 50% full at this point. Um, so it's dual, but it's manual. Okay, we still got a few more questions. While we go through these questions, I'm going to put in the chat for everyone. We're actually going to continue this discussion, but it's actually not going to be in a webinar format. We'll be in an actual normal Zoom room. Um, so the room probably won't be open just yet. So if you jump in straight away, you will get the waiting room. We'll come over or one of us will come over initially right at 2.30. But um, if you have any specific questions, more about your own research rather than music, so it might just be a little bug of like, I'm trying to do this and I can't click on something like that. Um, we can do that. We can have a few more in-depth discussions if people um, you know, want to talk more about their research. Um, but like Aidan said, it, you know, we won't be giving advice as such on, oh, you need to do this in Redcap or you need to do this in Qualtrics. Um, we can more give you some ideas on functionalities and little tips and tricks that you may have. Um, so Aidan and I and possibly a few of our colleagues will actually be over in that um, post webinar uh, discussion where we can share and talk more. So everyone is welcome to that. Um, it is worth noting as well, this webinar was recorded today. So we will, um, the webinars are available on our website. Um, you can find it, I should probably, you know, someone's got the direct link ready to go, but you can find all the recordings of not only today's webinar, but the other webinars that we initially ran last year, you can access them all there as well. Um, so the, that Carolyn's question about um, unique records ID in, in both systems, I think RedCap definitely we can have a unique record ID. We can, we can assign any ID you like, you know, in whichever format. And in Quartrix, I haven't tried. Um, uh, have you got those have some experience? Had some experience? Um, my okay. answer was going to be the same as yours. I know you certainly can in Redcap. I can't think of an instance where I've done it. In yeah, so there's a, there is a um, there is a piece of uh, sort of hidden metadata called a response ID, and this is a randomly generated um, string. Um, uh, maybe not randomly, but it's it's a unique string. It sort of looks like numbers and letters and so on. It's about thirty two characters long, 
uh, and it exists, uh, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily pertain to the individual uh, like it does in REDCat because it's, it's minted for every new uh, response. So it's really a response ID rather than a record ID, but it could be used for that if you, um, if you, if you want. Uh, so if you look into the, the, the Qualtrics documentation for response ID, um, it'll show you how you can use it. Maybe I'll, I'll just try and find it and see if I can see if I can find it really quickly. So it's not found for the last link. Oh, I'm sorry. It should have an S on the end. Yeah, I'll just go it for you. My apologies. Hopefully that works. I did just type it in, you know, uh, rather than copy and paste it. That looks better. So uh, sorry about posting the wrong link. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're just about to hit two thirty. So. Like I said, we're going to close this off in a moment. Um, thank you to those who asked questions. If we didn't get to your question, there are still a few. Um, feel free to jump across to this other Zoom. I will post the link again. Where we will be. Uh, in fact, I'll head there now. And yeah, Aiden will head over now to start letting people in. So once you get there, you'll get to the waiting room. Aiden will let you in. I'll hang around for another couple of minutes just to close this off. Uh, once again, thanks very much for your time today. Um, if you have any questions um, and you can't make it to the uh, discussion after this, I'm going to put a couple more emails in the chat. Help at intersect.org.au will obviously get you to any of us. If you are interested in anything specifically in training for yourself or your organisation, you can email that one, which will actually will get Wacy, Aiden, myself, and our training manager. Um, those are the two keys. So if you have any questions, obviously come on over. Um, hopefully we'll see several of you in a couple of minutes for a more detailed chat if you have some more questions um, on how things work. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And I suppose just once more for good luck, here's that last inter the Zoom link for our chat, which Aiden is in now. Um, enjoy your afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Bye.